Hello and welcome to episode 7 of Chemistry in 15 Minutes or Less. My name is Audra and this review lesson is on chapter 5, Periodic Law. Periodic law itself states that the physical and chemical properties of the elements are periodic functions of their atomic numbers. The periodic table, as you might already know, was first created by a man by the name of Mendeleev, and the columns on the periodic table are called groups, the rows are called periods, and the chemical properties are generally explained by outermost electron configuration. Groups and periods tend to behave similarly, as well as some categorizing groups that we'll talk about in just a second. Before we get into groups like the alkali metals and the halogens, we need to talk about the blocks that relate back to the electron configuration we talked about in the last chapter. The periodic table can be broken up into a couple of quote-unquote blocks that base on if their electron configuration notation ends on which sublevel. Basically, everything, these two rows on the left, are what's called the S block. These groups over here are the P block, the groups in the middle are the D block, and this other section down here is the F block. Most of what we're going to talk about falls into either the S, D, or P block, and the S and P are your main blocks on the table. Now let's get into some specific groups and some things that we might have already talked about. The first thing we are going to talk about is group 18. This right here is the group of noble gases. They all end in P6 for their notation, as you can see, this one would, uh, 13 would be P1, P2, P3, P4, P5, so we end in P6 over here. And these are generally our most unreactive or inert gases. This is because they have a full valence shell. They have all of their electrons on the outside and meet what's called the octet rule, which basically says that electrons want to have a full valence shell with eight valence electrons. They are unlikely then to gain or lose electrons because their shell is full and they would like to stay that way, and that's why they don't react. The next important group we are going to talk about is over here. This first group right here are your alkali metals. They all end in S1 and are the most reactive metals on the table. They are very, very likely to lose an electron. This means that they form what are called 1 plus ions, said they end in S1, because the reason they are reactive is because they only have the one in their outer shell, and in order to get down to a smaller sublevel that is full, they want to get rid of that electron, so that way they are most similar to the noble gases, and then don't want to react. Right next to them, we have the alkaline earth metals, which is group 2. Also in the S block, these end in S2, and are slightly less reactive, but are still pretty reactive, and they are still more likely to lose electrons and form 2 plus ions instead of the 1 plus ions over here, because that is how they become similar to the noble gases and stop reacting. Another important group over here is the halogens, which as you can see is group 17. These all end in P5 and are the most reactive of the non-metals. So, Unlike the alkali metals on the other side, they are likely to gain an electron to make them similar to the noble gases on this side, which is why they are so reactive. This is things like fluorine and chlorine that we'll talk about in a second with electronegativity. Now some other groups are the transition metals, which is this entire D block here in the center. This block of metals, it's groups 3 to 12, they all end in D to B something because it covers such a wide variety, and they have differing reactivity depending on what they are, and they also have mixed ions depending on where they are in the table. Some of them form 2+, plus or 3+, plus or 4+, plus. some crazy things depending on where they are in the table. And we also have to talk about the last group, which is the other nonmetals. Now, if you remember from the first episode where we talked about this, there is a dividing line right here between the metals and the nonmetals. And there are some things, metalloids here in the middle, that are a half wavelength. Metals are over here, nonmetals are over here. That leaves us with the other nonmetals that are down in this area or up in here that aren't part of the halogens or the noble gases. Now, this is parts of groups 12 to 16, and they have low to moderate reactivity, but they are more likely to lose an electron because they are closer to the noble gases on this side. Some do gain electrons, but it's 
less likely because that's what happens on this side of the table, and they generally form two minus or three minus ions. I should have said um, the halogens form the one minus, and some of these in here form two minus. Like aluminum specifically forms a three plus. So I remember that one. But some other things we need to talk about while we are on the periodic table are electron affinity, ionization energy, and atomic radii. Now, first we'll talk about electron affinity, which is an atom's ability to lose an electron. Now, electron affinity follows a very specific periodic trend. Right across the table, it goes down as you go to the left, but increases as you go up the table. Next trend that we will talk about is something called ionization energy. Now, ionization energy is the energy required to remove an electron from a neutral atom. Now, its trend is similar to electron affinity in the fact that it does go up the further up the table that it goes, but instead it decreases as it goes right instead of going left. And the last trend we need to talk about is atomic radii. Atomic radii is just the distance from mid-nucleus to the edge of the electron cloud, and it follows the trend of electron affinity as it goes down the further left you go, but it also goes down when you go down a group. Now I know that's quite a lot, but we have a couple of minor other things we need to talk about before we stop. We do need to talk about electronegativity. Now, electronegativity is the ability of an atom in a compound to attract electrons of another element. Now, the most electronegative element is fluorine, which we assign a value of 4. This is the only electronegativity value you need to memorize. But you need to know that fluorine, and from on the table, it just sort of radiates outwards, going down, the further away from fluorine you get. So the final things to talk about are shielding, which you should have talked about in the last chapter, but this is where we discussed it, which is basically the repulsion of electrons. They want to be really, really far away from each other, so if you have an atom that looks like this, electrons are not going to want to be here and here. Instead, they're going to want to be here and here. And we also need to talk about cation versus anion. Cation is just a positive ion with something like a 1 plus or a 2 plus charge, which we saw in the alkali metals, and an anion is a negative ion that has something like a 1 minus or a 2 minus charge, like we saw in the nonmetals and the halogens. And so this should conclude episode 7 of Chemistry in 15 minutes or less. Feel free to leave questions or suggestions in the comments below, and be sure to follow the in-video links, check out the playlist, or head over to my channel for more videos on Chemistry Review. As always, I hope this was of some assistance, and I hope you have a great night.